Welcome back. Today we're going to talk a little bit about exchange rates and the balance of payments. So first we want to talk a little bit about the balance of trade, which is just the difference between exports and the imports of goods. So the balance of payments, on the other hand, is a system of accounts that measures transactions of goods, services, and income, and also financial assets between domestic households, businesses, and governments, and residents of the rest of the world during a specific time period. Right? That's kind of a fancy definition. And here's sort of a table that tells you what counts as a surplus item, or like a credit to the account, and a deficit item, like a debit to the account. All right, so here's accounting identities. And I mean, an identity is just something that is kind of equal by definition. So an accounting identity is an accounting value that is equal by definition. For example, net lending by households must equal net borrowing by business and government. So you can kind of think of like a family. When a family expenditures incre uh, exceed income, the family should be doing one of the following. They should be reducing uh, its money holdings or selling stocks or bonds or other assets. It should be borrowing, receiving gifts from friends or relatives, or receiving public transfers for government uh, to uh, sort of finance the expenditures. There's this concept of disequilibrium. If expenditures exceed income, uh, the situation cannot continue indefinitely. Um, at, at some point, it should return to equilibrium, where the accounting identity is, uh, is retained. There are three kind of different categories of balance of payment transactions. There's uh, transactions on the current account, on the capital account, and on official reserve account transactions. So first we'll start talking about the current account. The current account is a category of balance of payment transactions that measures the exchange of merchandise, the exchange of services, and unilateral transfers. You can think of like merchandising trade and exports and imports, like tangible items like clothes or, or computers that get traded, uh, service export and imports, oops, sorry, service exports and imports are intangible items that are bought and sold, perhaps like uh, um, some sort of uh, intellectual property that's exchanged. And then there's unilateral transfers, which are gifts from citizens and from governments. Here's sort of this uh, table talking about different uh, sort of a balance sheet for current account, capital account, and uh, the official reserves. So there's this kind of balancing act that happens with the current account. The current account surplus is next net exports plus unilateral transfers plus net investment income if it's greater than zero. And, while, and a deficit is, is just the opposite if it's negative. So a current account deficit means that we are importing more goods and services than we export. And a current account deficit must be paid by the export of money or money equivalent. And the capital account is a category of balance of payment transactions that measures the flow of real and financial assets. A current account and capital account must sum to zero in the absence of interventions by finance ministries or central banks. And here's kind of a nice identity. And here's a uh, nice graph of the current account and uh, capital account over time. Official reserve account transactions, right? We talked about the other two already. So these are uh, transactions of foreign currencies, of gold, special drawing rights, uh, your reserve position in the IMF, which we'll talk about a little bit, and financial uh, assets held by uh, offices like the Treasury. So special drawing rights are reserve assets created by the IMF for countries to use in settling international payment obligations. So what is the IMF? The IMF is the International Monetary Fund. It's an agency that was founded to administer uh, an international foreign exchange system and to lend to members of countries that had a balance of payment problems. Right? It, it functions as sort of this international lender of last resort. So when you buy foreign products, right, and you have dollars, right, and you're you're buying in the, in that that foreign good in dollars, but the foreign country 
probably isn't paying their workers in dollars. So there has to be some way of exchanging dollars for that foreign currency. And this gives rise to a foreign exchange market. It's a market in which households, firms, and governments buy and sell national currencies at some exchange rate, right? And the exchange rate is the price of one nation's currency in terms of another nation's currency. So every U.S. transaction involving the uh, import of foreign goods constitutes a supply of dollars and a demand for some foreign currency. And the opposite is true for export. So we need to talk about different types of exchange rates. There are flexible exchange rates, which are exchange rates that are allowed to kind of move in the open market in, responded, in response to changes in supply and demand. Sometimes this is called a floating exchange rate. With uh, the equilibrium, uh, foreign exchange rate can kind of appreciate or depreciate. So for an example, uh, appreciation is like an increase in the exchange value for one uh, nation's currency in terms of another's. And you can have the same thing. So my, my currency can appreciate against yours, while uh, my currency can also depreciate against someone else's. Right? So you can have multiple happening. So now we're going to kind of go through this uh, panels of uh, different exchanges um, and what they do for what's called derived demand, uh, which is just deriving demand from, uh, from some schedule of pharmaceuticals. So here we're going to see uh, demand schedule for packages of European pharmaceuticals in the United States. And panel B will show the U.S. demand curve, which slopes downward for, US, or for European pharmaceuticals. So here's this schedule, and there is a demand curve. Uh, so here we're going to talk about uh, the number of, uh, of pounds of, of British currency required to purchase 700 packages. And if the price per package in the United Kingdom is 100 pounds, we can now find the quantity of pounds needed to pay for the various quantities demanded. Right? So there you go. So here's kind of this example of derived demand. In uh, panel D on 33.2, on, which is the next slide, uh, we see that derived demand for pounds in the United States in order to purchase the various quantities that we first saw, uh, that, that's what we're going to see, right? So in panel E, we draw the resultant demand curve. This is the U.S. derived demand for pounds. So here's panel D that we just talked about. And here's panel E, which is U.S. derived demand for British pounds. So let us now look at the uh, total demand for a supply of euros. So here we have the total demand for euros. There's a shift and a shift in supply. So much like commodities, exchange rates can shift with response to uh, uh, supply and demand. So market determines the exchange rate, right? Changes in real interest rates can affect the exchange rates. Changes in a country's productivity, changes in product preferences, or uh, some perceptions of economic stability, right? Or even political stability, right? If if there is some unstable government, that might change how uh, the rest of the world views your currency and then affects the exchange rate. So it's important to kind of get a history of floating exchange rates. And, and to do that, we need to talk about fixed exchange rates. And for one, we can talk about the gold standard. And the gold standard is like this international monetary system in which nations fix their reserve, their exchange rates to some reserve of gold. Um, and all currencies are fixed in terms of all others in, in these systems. And any balance of payment deficits or surpluses can be made up by shipping gold. And you can, again, have kind of a deficit and a surplus, and they're pretty much the opposite side of the same coin. Uh, but there are problems with the gold standard. You give up control of your own monetary policy, and you aren't 
uh, or you can't respond to sort of uh, um, economic crises as well if you are on a gold standard. And new gold discoveries can cause inflation, right? You're introducing more uh, ostensibly money into the system, so that can cause inflation. So we want to also get some more history, right? The Bretton Woods and the International Monetary Fund. In 1944, representatives of different capitalist countries met in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, and they created a new international payment system to replace the gold standards. Members agreed to maintain the value of their currency within 1% of declared par value, and we'll talk about what that is in a second. Members are allowed to make adjustments, and they can alter their exchange rates only with the IMF approval. So par value is the officially determined value of a currency. So Bretton Woods and the IMF, we have in 1971, continue on, continuing on the timeline, Richard Nixon suspends convertibility of the dollar into gold. And it was kind of this free fall for what was happening with the U.S. currency. And the United States devalued the dollar relative to uh, currencies of 14 major countries and uh, created a floating currency. Members of the EEC, which is now the European Union, allowed their currencies to float against the dollar. So people started uh, fixing their own currency to different currencies and letting other currencies float and letting other currencies stay fixed. Um, and in the, in the United States went off the Bretton Woods a system of uh, fixed exchange rates in 1973. Um, but at the time, many other nations of the world would have been less willing to let their uh, uh, values vary. And so here is this graph, or pie chart, I should say, of uh, current uh, exchange rate uh, uh, systems in the world. 